not exactly clear that we can trust Amy Coney Barrett and Kavanaugh and these others not to be just like Bill Barr. And so I think what scares people is that if he decides to do something that it legally makes no sense, and you're right, but Mr. Bauer is ready for him. But if somehow they manage to stumble into the Supreme Court, do any of you guys trust Uncle Clarence and Amy Coney Barrett and those guys to actually follow the letter of the law? No. I mean, it is a completely politicized Supreme Court that you can't just trust that they're going to do the right thing. Now, so far, the courts have actually been pretty good. So we'll see. Justice Pubic Hair on my Coke can. Justice Pubic Hair on my Coke can was confirmed to the Supreme Court. And even though we collectively knew how bad it was then, we didn't know just how problematic Tom would be until now. Now, the man who succeeded Thurgood Marshall, becoming the second black justice, and yet not representing the interests of black men at all, will certainly end up with an equally consequential legacy. For example, after benefiting from affirmative action, he was one of 12 black students entering Yale Law School in 1971, Justice Clayton Bigsby later firmly opposed it. And of course, there is Commander Waterford's staunch stance against abortion rights. There are many, many problems with Thomas, but the biggest, his insurrectionist sympathizing George Peel get out inspired wife. In the black community, we have uh, an expression, and I don't want to use this label too deeply here because I'm just trying to tell you what we have in the African American community. When we talk about a person of color, that goes back historically to the days of slavery and that person betraying his own community, we have a term in the black community. That term that we use is called uh, Uncle Tom. And Uncle Tom is a, either a fictional or non-fictional character. I don't really know the origin of Uncle Tom. I don't really know the origin of Uncle Tom. But it talks about a person who back during the days of slavery sold his What's up, everybody? Welcome to the BCV channel. I am your host, Pastor Seiko Woods. Please do the following. Please like, subscribe, share, hit the notification bell at the bottom of this video. That way, whenever I go live or post any content, you'll be one of the first to view it. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry financially, first of all, thank you so much for those who are doing so. We do appreciate that. You can also do so by clicking the donation links below at the bottom of this video as well. BCV information is listed as well. Those clips, if you were not offended for the lack of respect toward an individual like Justice Clarence Thomas, um, Supreme Court Justice, who actually made history um, by becoming the second um, black person to become a United States Supreme Court Justice uh, just after Thurgood Marshall's retirement. I don't know what else to tell you, but this is the attitude and disposition and mentality that we see going on amongst our own people. Like the old saying goes, it'd be your own people, your own people that does these kinds of things. But let me just go ahead and get started. There's an article I want us to talk about today, and um, you may have seen it, but if not, you will see it right now. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Democrat calls Clarence Thomas Uncle Tom, who sold his soul to the slave masters in debate on the Georgia statue. There's a Georgia statue that's, um, that was being voted on. I believe it's already passed uh, to honor Justice Thomas in, in Georgia. But this is gentlemen senator emmanuel jones does not want him to be recognized as such and so it reads as follows georgia democrat senator emmanuel jones took a state senate debate over a statute to new extremes on tuesday likening supreme court justice clarice thomas to an uncle tom who sold his soul to the slave masters quote I'm just trying to tell you what we have in the African-American community. When we talk about a person of color that goes back historically to the days of slavery and that person betraying his own community, we have a term in the black community, began Jones. That term that we use is called Uncle Tom, he declared, before going on to explain that it's meant to describe, quote, a person who back in during the days of slavery sold his soul to the slave masters, end quote. Jones 
joined the rest of his Democratic colleagues in unsuccessfully opposing a bill to build a statue of Thomas using money raised from private donations for the Peach State's Capitol building on Tuesday. The bill passed the upper chamber of the state legislature by a 12 vote margin. Now, interestingly, this is the same man that does not know the history behind Uncle Tom, as you heard in the clip that I just played. He's not familiar. He doesn't even know the history behind it, whether it's true or not, which speaks to his own ignorance. But I, I digress. But nonetheless, this is what he this is what he says. So this is the mentality and attitude you see amongst our people. Um, Thomas, who served as the chairman of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in the Reagan administration before becoming the second African-American to, to be confirmed by the to the Supreme Court, was born in Georgia and spent his formative years in the Jim Crow South. Jones is hardly the first progressive to charge the longest tenured justice with being a, tra a race traitor. In 2014, Mississippi Congressman and future January 6th committee chairman Benny Thompson also called Thomas an Uncle Tom, also submitting that Thomas, quote, doesn't like black people, end quote, or being black, quote, end quote. MSNBC host Joy Reid dubbed Thomas, quote, Uncle Clarence, end quote, live on air on election night 2020. In a pair, slight Slightly less egregious example, CNN's Don Lemon wondered aloud if Thomas should be dismissed as a sellout, quote unquote, by his fellow African-Americans and Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass, the runner up to Kamala Harris in Joe Biden's Veep Stakes, speculated that, quote, many people would like to see an African-American on the Supreme Court, end quote. We don't really need to go into Clarence Thomas's background or his behavior on the court continued Bass, before asserting that there had been an African-American voice on the court since Thurgood Marshall, whom Thomas replaced after Marshall's retirement in 1991. Last year, the Washington Post ascribed the thinking of white conservatives to Thomas while credulously quoting the aforementioned Thompson in a criticism of Thomas. The Republican-controlled Georgia House and Governor Brian Kemp will likely follow the, Senate's, the state Senate's lead and approve the commemorative measure. In another article, this is Fox News, quote, Georgia Democrats shredded for smearing Justice Thomas as an Uncle Tom as disgusting, and rightly so. Social media users were outraged Wednesday after, uh, after Georgia State Senator name, uh, Georgia State Senator, excuse me, smeared Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas as an Uncle Tom. The Georgia Senate approved placing a statue of Thomas at the state capitol Tuesday, but State Senator Emanuel Jones, of course, Democrat of Georgia, slammed the justice, the second black citizen to serve on the Supreme Court as a traitor to his racial group. And of course, you already see the quote. I already, I've already read that. He says he went on. And Uncle Tom is either a fictional or a non-fictional character. I don't really know the origin of Uncle Tom. So that speaks already to this man's ignorance. I don't really know the origin of Uncle Tom, but it's, it talks about a person who back during the days of slavery sold his soul to the slave masters. Commentators across Twitter slammed the state senator from a variety of angles for his disparaging comparison. The Federalist Senate senior contributor Benjamin Weingarten tweeted that his, this insult is part of a long tradition from Democrats. Quote, Justice Thomas, one of the greatest Americans in our history and perhaps the most revolutionary and exceptional jurist of at least the half century, will never, ever stop paying the thought crime of being black and conservative. He quote, he wrote, what's old is new again for the Democrats. Radio host Derek Hunter tweeted, quote, know your place, end quote, man making sure black men learn Democrats do not want them thinking for themselves, end quote. Pro-life outlet Life News tweeted, quote, a Democrat legislator calls Justice Clarence Thomas and Uncle Tom because he's conservative. There's nothing the left hates more than black Americans who don't conform to their agenda. Opinion writer Nicole Russell tweeted, quote, if you don't align with the mob, you'll be excoriated by it, end quote. Other commentators spoke about Thomas's own history, suggesting that Democrats are using double standards when they criticize him in such terms. X Strategies LLC senior digital strategist Greg Price tweeted, quote, 
Clarence Thomas may have been born in Georgia in poverty during segregation and grew up to become the second black justice on the Supreme Court. But he can read the Constitution and see there's no right to kill unborn babies. Therefore, he is an Uncle Tom. Sonny McSunnyface, a prominent conservative tweet, Twitter account, tweeted, quote, Clarence Thomas was born to farmer descendants as slaves, grew up, in, in, grew up poor in the Jim Crow South, and speaks English as a second language. If he voted differently on abortion, Democrats would consider him one of the leading inspirational stories of the modern era. GOP political director Elliot Echols wrote, quote, Clarence Thomas was raised by a single mom and became a Supreme Court justice. His life has been remarkable, and for Democrats to try to smear him is disgusting. If Clarence Thomas was a liberal, every city across the country would have a statute of him. The host of the Barrington Report and black former Democrat candidate for Georgia State Representative Barrington Martin II wrote, quote, George Floyd can have statues and you won't utter a word about that. But Clarence Thomas is an achiever that has superseded race and you ideologically called him and Uncle Tom in front of your colleagues. Thank you for confirming what I already thought about you. Some Twitter users took issue from a completely different perspective, claiming Jones was not aware of the actual Uncle Tom character the term came from. Bulls Insider Managing Editor Russ Wood wrote, quote, most people who use Uncle Tom as a slur neither bother to read Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel. If they did, they might be surprised at what they learned, end quote. Commentator Chris Loesch tweeted, quote, it's not even the actual story of Uncle Tom. Uncle Tom was a hero because he used non-resistance as a cover and tactic to protect other slaves who had escaped slavery. The character was beaten to death by a slave owner because he wouldn't give the location of two escaped slaves. Boston Globe opinion columnist Jeff Jacoby wrote, quote, this Georgia legislator is so dumb, he doesn't even know the source of the slur, Uncle Tom. But he knows that he abominates Clarence Thomas, who rose from desperate poverty to extraordinary eminence. Because Thomas is a conservative, this fool thinks he deserves to be smeared. Meanwhile, some liberal Twitter users appeared to say what they wish that the justice had trended on Twitter due to death or illness. Of course, you see the comments right there. Evil knows no bounds, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Evil knows no bounds. But that's that's just some of what I want to talk about. But as you see the reports there, um, those who know the story of, of, of Uncle Tom and where it derives and where it came from, we, we know. Um, actually, it should be used as a term of endearment, to be honest with you. Because those who have read Harry Beecher Stowe's work in her book know that that is what people who know the truth would consider Uncle Tom to be uh, a hero. Now, I want to give a little bit of history behind this because I think it is very important because there are some of you who may watch this video and may think that... The senator from Georgia, Mr. Jones, Emmanuel Jones, what they call him, is writing his assessment <clears throat> of Justice Thomas, and he's definitely wrong. Um, but let's go ahead and read some more of the truth behind this story, shall we? The true story behind Uncle Tom's cabin. This is from CBN News. The true story behind Uncle Tom's Cabin, the book that rocked pre-Civil War America. When Uncle Tom was published, Uncle Tom's Cabin was published in 1852, the anti-slavery novel flew off the shelves. 17 printing presses ran 24 hours a day to keep up with demand, making it the best-selling novel of the 19th century. Quote, the book struck at our emotions as a nation, end quote. Norfolk State University's Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander explains, quote, and it made us see ourselves. It was our emotional mirror, and it prompted some individuals to decide to rethink how they thought of slavery, end quote. Uncle Tom's cabin has been cited as a factor leading to the Civil War. When Abraham Lincoln later met author Harry Beecher Stowe, he allegedly said, quote, so you're the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. In 1852, the black lash 
was immediate and powerful. In 1852, the backlash was immediate and powerful. In the South, the book was banned. And if you were caught selling the book, you were either going to be killed or thrown in prison, says Newby Alexander. There was tremendous fear that this book would make a difference. It did, portraying Uncle Tom as a dignified, intelligent, God-fearing man. In the South, however, traveling Tom shows became popular by depicting him as a submissive buffoon. Happy in his enslaved condition, a stereotype that remains today. There are also attempts to discredit Harry Beecher Stowe. The author countered with a key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, an exhaustive biography of the real people behind her fictional characters. It included her primary inspiration for Uncle Tom, Josiah Henson. Do you hear that, Senator Jones? Josiah Henson was an individual who I think demonstrated extraordinary courage, says New Dr. Newby Alexander. He tried to help people. He tried to help other people, especially whites in this country, to understand the reality of slavery, the horror of slavery, the price of slavery. Josiah Hen Henson's story begins in Rockville, Maryland, on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. What was once a 570-acre plantation is now a suburban neighborhood. The Josiah Henson Park sits on the remaining property, including the original house where the owner lived, a man named Isaac Riley. In this time period, masters wanted to present themselves to be very benevolent. These patriarchs who cared about their people that were enslaved, explains Jamie Coons, a senior historian for Montgomery County Parks. But the presentation that Henson gives, gives us was that didn't happen for Isaac Riley. Quote, I faithfully served Riley for many years, Henson later wrote. He was coarse and vulgar in his habits and unprincipled and cruel in his general deportment, end quote. Henson's autobiography provides many examples of Riley's cruelty, like the day he discovered a book on grammar hidden in nine-year-old Josiah's cap. When Riley saw the book, of course, he was outraged because it was unheard of that his enslaved people would learn to read and write, explained Coons. Pick up that book, he cried, using an awful, awful oath. Henson writes, at last, I was obliged to do it. When he beat me across the head and back till my eyes were swollen and I became unconscious, end quote. Despite the harsh treatment, Henson proved to be trustworthy. Eventually elevated to overseeing the plantation, Henson eased the harsh conditions faced by his fellow slaves. Riley even allowed 18-year-old Josiah to attend a revival meeting. Although not allowed to enter the church, he heard a life changing message from preacher John McKinney. He said, Jesus Christ, the son of God, tasted death for every man. Henson wrote, it touched my heart and I cried out. I wonder if Jesus Christ died for me again and again. Did the preacher reiterate the words for every man? Oh, the blessedness and sweetness of the feeling that I was loved. That meant a lot to him because he knew that God would always be on his side, says Coombs. He would deliver him and he would dedicate his plan in life. He would, he would decide his plan in life. The plan included moving his family and 18 others to Isaac Riley's brother's home in Kentucky. When he got to Cincinnati, Henson found his faithfulness tested. Although Ohio was a free state and many black men encouraged him to stay, he stood firm. He felt like he had been tasked with this duty and he was going to fulfill it, explained Coons. He had taken care of them and they felt like if he wants us to carry along, we'll go with him. Henson came to regret this decision. Three years after the, their arrival in Kentucky, those who followed him were put up for auction. Husbands and wives, parents and children were to be separated forever, wrote Henson. From that hour, I saw through hatred and cursed the whole system of slavery. One absorbing purpose occupied my soul to gain freedom, self-assertion and deliverance from the cruel caprices and fortunes of dissolute tyrants. Because of Henson's management skills, he and his family were initially allowed to stay together. Two years later, however, his time had come. The only option, escape. A major obstacle was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, which meant 
he and his family could be captured even in a free state. So he set his sights on Canada. It was a 600 mile journey that he would have to make on foot with his wife and four children traveling by night, sleeping by day. Super dangerous, explains Jared Brock, author of the Henson biography, The Road to Dawn. But he knows he's got to go to Canada. It's the only place that he can truly be a free man. Josiah's wife made a sling for him to carry the two youngest children on his back with only the North Star as their guide. The family began their journey. After 40 grueling days, they arrived at Lake Erie, just across the water from Canada. A sympathetic ship captain offered to take them the rest of the way. He put his hand on my head and said, be a good fellow, won't you? Writes Henson. I felt streams of emotion running down in electric courses from head to foot. Yes, said I, I will use my freedom well. I will give my soul to God. Henson helped start a black settlement in Ontario, including a multiracial school almost unheard of at the time. To raise money and awareness, he traveled through the United States and England, where he was granted a private audience with Queen, Vic with Queen Victoria. During those years, he risked his life to help a total of 118 slaves reach freedom in Canada. He's an inspiration for me personally, and I hope for many people as they hear this story to use our freedom well, says Brock, to use our resources, our time, our money, our energy, our voice, our influence, to use it on behalf of those with less than us. Near the end of his life, Josiah Henson visited the plantation he once managed. Although many of his experiences here when were unimaginably painful, Josiah could see God's hand in them, writing, sharp flashes of lightning come from black clouds. Amazing piece, isn't it? Absolutely an amazing piece. And it's one thing to hear it read, but it's another thing to hear it visually told. Hundreds pass by this sign every day on Highway 144 and this one on Highway 60. But who is the man behind that name on a sign? Let me take you back to Eastern Davis County and the year 1825. Local historian Aloma Dew guides us through time. At that time, this was a very agricultural area. This was where the most people were. So this was the heaviest concentration of slaves. And that is how a man named Josiah Henson found himself here on this land nearly 200 years ago. I think his story, it's a story we should all know because it's about a way of life that too often in the South we discount. That way of life? Slavery. Josiah Henson was born a slave in Maryland. Josiah tells us himself in his autobiography that he got a manager position because, quote, the especial favor of my master. That was Isaac Riley, who later tasked Josiah with leading 18 other slaves to his brother's farm all of the way in Davis County, Kentucky, near Maceo. A very dangerous journey. This is a travel pass that was provided uh, to Josiah Henson. Kathy Olson with the Owensboro Science and History Museum has studied Josiah's story as well. He was persistent. He was uh, honest in, in his work. He was hardworking. Which is why she says he didn't escape just yet. They did stop in Cincinnati and spend some time. Uh, and at that point, they could have escaped uh, because they were in a free state and Josiah had made a promise and he did not want to break that promise. Kathy says he pushed on to Kentucky where he worked for Amos Riley. Josiah tells us he again became a manager, quote, in consequence of the recommendation for ability and honesty, which I brought with me from Maryland. That's something that people need to know. This was not a docile uh, person who was being beaten along the way. This was a man who was doing his work even though he knew he had no freedom. Josiah explains in his autobiography how he tried to buy his freedom, but he was cheated in the end. Fearing he would be sold or possibly killed, Josiah started to plot another dangerous journey, one that would lead to freedom. The fact that you would risk your life and everything to run away 
That's not easy to do. But that's what Josiah did. Escaping across the Ohio River, his family made it all the way up to Canada. They were free, and his story was just starting. Well, two stories. In 1852, a woman named Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote a bestseller that would change the country forever, Uncle Tom's Cabin. She later revealed Josiah Henson was an inspiration for Uncle Tom. That book was a major factor. It's fairly short, definitely propaganda in many ways, but she was an abolitionist and she was definitely inspired by Josiah Henson's stories and I'm sure others. But yes, Abraham Lincoln said, so you're the little lady who started the Civil War because that book was a major factor. Josiah went on to become a preacher and an abolitionist. He wrote his autobiography and, according to Aloma, started a vocational school for other escaped slaves, a true example of making a name for himself. We don't know the names of most of the slaves. We know Josiah Henson. That's a real person who has a real name who accomplished real things. A real name now on a sign. But it's the real story, a story of endurance a story of freedom, a story that would start a movement that defines the man behind the name. In Davis County, Shaley Clark, 14 News. So when I hear and see and read how people disrespect individuals like uh, Justice Clarence Thomas and others who hold to conservative values and who really um, appreciate our people and are willing to serve our people by telling our people the truth. Um, of course, I feel some kind of way about it. But when I hear people make disparaging comments about individuals like Clarence Thomas and others, I have no other, other recourse but to call them fools, as the Proverbs does. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2, the Bible says, a fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. That's what a fool does. And that is exactly what Senator Emanuel Jones did. He just revealed his own foolishness. I mean, on the Senate floor, on the Senate floor, he, he pretty much shared before the world how foolish and how dumb and stupid he really sounded because he does not know his history. But of course, when you keep repeating lies like that, as though it is true, then it's the kind of things that people believe. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 12. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 20, the Bible says, do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than for him. So a person who's, <laughs> a person who's wise in his own eyes, God says there's more hope for a fool than for him. A person who's quick to speak, hasty with their words, don't think things through, there's more hope for a fool than for them. Now, it's interestingly, I, I, I did another a little study, if you will. And I wanted to know what kind of people are considered influential and, and considered to be uh, most important in our, in our communities. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure some of you may have looked at it as well too. I know I have, and there is a list of 100 Americans, African Americans, quote unquote. And of course, if you're not from Africa, the term African American is technical for people like Elon Musk. But anyway, I digress. But for the sake of for the sake of conversation, there's a list of 100 uh, most influential uh, Americans, and I'm going to start at the bottom and then just work my way up. And as you can see, Justice Clarence Thomas is not mentioned. People like Dr. Thomas Sowell, Dr. Walter Williams, posthumously. Shelby Steele, Bob Woodson, Dr. Ben Carson, Dr. Carol M. Swain. These individuals are not listed in this in this list of 100 greatest African Americans. This is on Wikipedia, but there's a book that outlines and lists these individuals' names, and this is why it is populated here as well. But just take a look. Look at all these names here. Some, from a human standpoint, should be here. Others shouldn't be. That's just one list here. And the book is 100 Great Greatest African Americans by Molefi Kete Asante. 
But then the root also came with the with their their list of 100 most influential African Americans in 2020. And if you go down their list, you won't see any of the aforementioned names that I mentioned here. Dr. Clarence Thomas, you won't see it. Dr. Thomas Sowell, you won't see it. Dr. Walter Williams, posthumously, you won't see his name. Shelby Steele, Bob Woodson, you won't see his name. Dr. Ben Carson, you won't see his name. In fact, in Detroit, Dr. Ben Carson's name was taken off of one of the schools that he uh, was recognized and honored as, as a result of the woke mob. But look at this individual. This person's name here is listed as, as <laughs> top 100 most influential people among African Americans. Another one. Both of these individuals, lesbian, of course, Black Lives Matter. These people right here have nothing to do with the advancement of the black community. If anything, they, they want to destroy it. Some of these people's names here that's listed here don't know who they are. Most of them probably are a Democrat. This individual right here is another one. Anti-black, although they claim that they support black people, but you destroy your people through abortion and through same-sex, quote-unquote, marriage, which is not marriage at all. But look at these names. Woke. And on and on it goes. None of these, none of these names that are... Look at this one. Need I say more? And on and on it goes, ladies and gentlemen. You see this one here? Need I say more? Surprising to see Jay-Z in here. But of all these individuals and people, I'm pretty sure there are some in here who, who've made some contributions to our society, but for the most part, most of them have not. If anything, they have done more to destroy it. But anyway, I just wanted to leave my thoughts about this because, again, this is, this is the problem I see in, in our community. We have a lot of people who claim to be for us that are not really for us. A person like um, Justice Clarence Thomas should be recognized and should be respected because of the work he has done. And, of course, the only way we can turn and stem the tide on these types of narratives is continue to can is continue to speak the truth and to speak the truth boldly, unashamedly and fearlessly. That's what we should do, especially those of us who are Christians. So let me know what you think about this video in the comment section below. I would love to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts about this. Do you think individuals like uh, Senator uh, Emmanuel Jones is right in his statements regarding uh, Clarence Thomas? How do you respond or how would you respond to people going forward when you hear people being called Uncle Tom? Are you going to challenge them or are you just going to remain quiet and silent? But let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm trying to see something.